morning. I'm Reverend Phyllis Barrett, and I'm so glad that you're here this morning. And the thing that I love the most that I can sit up here and see is everyone waving to each other. It's wonderful that we are a place of fellowship and worship, and I just welcome you for being here. I would like for you to take at this time your registration pads that can be found at the end of your pew. If you please fill those out, pass them down, and if you see someone come in a few minutes late, will you just help them and give that to them so we have a, a good attendance record of people that are here today. Also, I wanted to make a special announcement that next Sunday, August the 19th at 9.30 uh, in room 350, we're gonna have a special uh, like Sunday school class that Dave and Allison Alvarado are going to be teaching on our healthy plate. It's a guideline of just showing us experiencing and how we can grow closer to God and what this church, that is our discipleship plan. So if you would like to be part of that, just please go to room 350 at 930 next Sunday. Also, a very special uh, event that was going to be held at our church is uh, going to be given by Tipa Snow. If you don't know Tipa Snow, she is the leading expert on dementia care. It, uh, she is world renowned, known, and I hope you take the opportunity to come and learn about what is plaguing so many of the people of today. It's gonna be on Friday, September the 7th from nine in the morning till 3 p.m. Uh, it's not just boring lecture. I've heard Tipa speak and I promise you will be laughing the entire time. She's entertaining, but it's educational and it will help you how to deal with loved ones. And even if you don't have a loved one that has dementia, there's someone we know is touched by it. And so it's a way for us to learn as a congregation to be a community of faith that can help people that are dealing with this issue. Also know that we already have over 250 people registered. Uh, we plan to have at least 500 people at this event. If you would like to volunteer to help with this, you can call the church office. Also, if you need adult daycare so that you're able to come, if you're caring for someone, please call the church and we will make arrangements for that because we want nothing to stop you from being able to come to this event. So at this time, I invite us to turn our hearts and soul to God as we begin our worship. Would you please stand for our call to worship? The Lord is our strength and our protection. The Lord was our saving help. Oh, give thanks to the Lord who is good.
Would you please turn back in your bulletin as we affirm our faith together? We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and to serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. be seated. We want you to know that the Lowry family, who you see listed here for the sacrament of baptism, they've postponed the baptism so that they can have as many family members here as possible. So that will not be today. So prepare yourselves now, if you would, to hear these words from the gospel according to John. Many Samaritans in that city believed in Jesus because of the woman's word when she testified, he told me everything I've ever done. So when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. Many more believed because of his word. And they said to the woman, we no longer believe because of what you said. For we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is truly the Savior of the world. God speaks to us through the reading of Scripture. Thanks be to God. Ah! 
Now would the children please come forward for the children's moment. Good morning, my friends. Good morning. I am back a second Sunday, and I had some of you in my Sunday school class this morning, so I've already gotten to see you. Um, there's plenty of room. Y'all scoot over and maybe the front row. There we go. Well, I am glad to see you a second week. And the past, last Sunday and this Sunday, oh, wait a minute. I need to introduce you to somebody. This is my helper, Eva. Can you say hi to Eva? Hi, Eva. How about back here? All you, everybody want to say hi to Eva? Hi. Yeah. She's brave to be my helper. <laughs> Thank you, Eva. So we've been talking about um, sharing our faith with other people. And last week, her brother Witt was here, and we talked about being good listeners. And this week, we're talking about sharing our stories with people so that they might come and visit our church, they might know God in a personal way, they might know the stories of Jesus. So this week we're talking about what we might say to our friends, maybe to invite them to church, okay? So I'm gonna ask Miss Eva to be my friend this morning, and I'm going to share with her, I'm gonna invite her to church, okay? And she's gonna tell me how I did. Okay, look, ready, Eva? Okay, so Eva, I want you to come to our church because I have the best Sunday school class, and you better come to my class, and we have the best church in town, and you are not cool if you don't come to our church. How did I do? Bad. Aw. <laughs> How did that make you feel, Eva? Not so good? Okay, let me, let me try again. May I have a second try, Eva? Okay, thanks. Okay, let me try. Let's tell my story. Okay, hi, Eva. I'm Miss Nancy, and I just wanted you to know that um, you are welcome at our church, and here's something, a little something about me. Did you know that I grew up in this church? I was baptized here, and my mom, who's sitting right over there on the front row, brought me to Sunday school almost every week, and brought me to vacation Bible school, and I was in the choir, and I, because I had really nice teachers that told me stories about Jesus, and I felt loved here, that God became a very important part of my life. I became a minister. I served eight churches, and now I'm back in my home church, and I teach a Sunday school class called um, uh, God's Creation, and I try to make it fun and interesting, and I'd really like for you to come to my class, but any of the classes would be good, um, but I just want you to know I really care, and I'd love for you to come to my class or any of our other classes. How did I do? Okay, was that better? Yeah. <laughs> a little better than the first time, I'd say, or a lot better. But um, all I did was just kind of share my story with Eva. That was my own personal story. I didn't have any magic words. I was sweet with her. I'd already, you know, let's say I already listened to her, and then I was sharing my story. So that, that was, hey, thanks, Eva. You're a good listener. Okay, let's have a prayer. Let's pray. Loving and gracious God, we thank you that you love us. And Lord, help us to be patient and first listen to our friends. And then God, give us the courage and the wisdom to share our stories with others so that they may know how you have loved us and touched us and how they can be loved by you also. We thank you for our church and our church friends and for all the blessings we have. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, you may go back to your parents. Thanks, Eva.
Well, don't you think that Reverend Nancy did a great job sharing her story the second time? Well done. Well, now we have an opportunity to share a part of the Christian story with one another, and that is being able to stand, to move around, to say good morning, and to offer others the peace of Christ. Would you please do that now? You may be seated. Before we consider our scripture or our message today, just a word of thanks to our wonderful choir for your faithfulness and your leadership, and not just on Sundays, but your rehearsal and your preparation. Thank you so much. Thank you to Rachel and for Peggy for sharing your wonderful special music and your gifts. Thank you for all of our volunteers, the dozens of you who serve in worship and in Sunday school classes and in the mission all over uh, to be God's people in the world every single Sunday. So thank you so, so very much. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Lance Marshall. I'm the senior associate pastor here at the church. Our senior pastor, Dr. Tim Brewster, is enjoying some well-deserved time of rest and relaxation with his family. I was here last week as well. I'll be back in the gathering where I normally preach next week here in the sanctuary. Our youth are going to be leading us in a special time of worship. Dr. Brewster will be back that week, and then we'll continue regular worship the week following. So, uh, so thankful that you're all here with us today. And this is your first time with me as the speaker. One of the things you may want to know is that something I'm very aware of. I tend to be a bit excitable and uh, energetic as the speaker on a Sunday morning. Uh, in fact, I'll tend to cover a lot of ground. In fact, I was busy congratulating myself because at the 9.30 service today, I did everything I could to stay absolutely as still as possible. I was very pleased with myself. I just checked my pedometer while we were worshiping and I am already at 6,000 steps. Uh, 
That's a mile and a half just in one sermon, and that's me congratulating myself on my stationariness. So I know that I'm enthusiastic. I know that I'm excitable. I know I am particularly such when we're talking about what we're talking about today and last week, and that is evangelism. Evangelism is faith sharing. Evangelism is communicating to other people the good news of Jesus Christ. And I am incredibly enthusiastic about evangelism, not just because I'm a pastor, not just because I'm a preacher, not just because I'm a Bible study leader and teacher, not just because of all these different roles. I am incredibly excitable and enthusiastic about evangelism because I am an adult convert to Christianity. Those of you who have heard my story before know I share it all the time. I, was grown, I grew up being taken to church occasionally, but it never really stuck. Uh, I was engaged a little bit as a teenager or an elementary school student. I went through confirmation and never really stuck. By the time I was a teenager, I was gone. I had no interaction with the church or with faith or with the concept of Christ or God in my life whatsoever all through my college years and my earliest young adulthood. And all of a sudden, I found myself in the world hurting and desperate and yearning for something more. All of a sudden, I found myself in my very young adulthood realizing that the message that I had internalized was that the only thing the world was about was about using your gifts and your opportunities and everything else and trying to get ahead. Right, that was it. That was the story that I was pursuing. And so quickly, right, so immediately after starting my young adulthood in the world that way, I found that all I was on was a treadmill on a rat race, and I found it so miserable, and I had nothing that gave me hope. I was hurting, right? And I was never one of the people who fell into the traps of toxic relationships or drugs or alcohol or even debt or anything like that. I was just someone who saw the world and the story that he'd been told about the world around him and I saw it so empty, right? And I saw it so meaningless and I saw it so depressing that I was hurting and I was in desperate need of something more. And it was in the midst of all of that that I started to encounter people and I started to remember stories, and I found something so much more, something so much greater, something worth living for in the good news of Jesus Christ. I'm not just someone who happens to be up here. I am up here because in the midst of my hurting, right, in the midst of my lostness, in the midst of my desperately seeking something more, other people shared with me the good news of Jesus Christ, and it changed my life for the better, so completely, so thoroughly, so eternally, you can only call it being saved, right? So of course I am enthusiastic about evangelism. I'm enthusiastic about evangelism in the exact same way that someone had a life transforming weight loss would be enthusiastic about changes to their diet or exercise program. Right? I am enthusiastic about evangelism in the very same way that someone was transformed from a life of crushing death into financial stability by Financial Peace University. I am enthusiastic about evangelism in the very same way that someone who had a life-threatening chronic condition would feel about the medicine that changed everything for them. Right? I am enthusiastic about evangelism because if you take our congregation right here, and you add it together with every other one of the hundreds of congregations that are worshiping together in the city of Fort Worth right now, large and small, each and every one of us added all together, together all the people that are gathered for worship and the proclamation of the good news of Christ at this moment in the city of Fort Worth, we are in the vast minority. Do not ever forget that. We are still in the vast minority and surrounding each and every one of us in our neighborhoods and surrounding each and every one of us in our schools and each and every one of us in our extended families and our places of business are people who are hurting and who are looking for the answer for something more. That is why I am enthusiastic about evangelism because I've experienced it and there are so many others who are yearning for what I have found. So we're talking about evangelism. Last week and this week, we're talking about evangelism and more than just the idea that we need to be evangelists, right? Or that each and every one of us can be evangelists or that each and every one of us should be evangelists. What we're talking about is how to do evangelism, right? How to actually do it. 
right? With the understanding that 99.9% .9 of the evangelism that's ever happened in the face of the planet Earth, right, of all the souls that are won, of all the lives that have been changed, all of the 99.9% the, the of the real life-changing evangelism that's ever taken place in the world wasn't done by a superstar, right, speaking into a huge megaphone at a stadium revival, and it wasn't done by someone standing on a street corner handing out pieces of paper or yelling into a microphone. 99.9% .9 of the real life-changing evangelism that's ever happened in the lives of you and other people has happened in simple and honest and humble one-on-one -on -one conversations between two ordinary people. Right? So for each and every one of us, people like myself who aren't gifted with this incredible ability right, to say the perfect thing at the right time, or who aren't incredibly brave, right, or who aren't incredibly novel and creative in ways to reach people, for ordinary people just like you and me, how do we do evangelism? So last week we talked about the real evangelism, evangelism for ordinary people. Evangelism in your life and in my life is going to be rooted first in the process of listening. Listening. Right? The first step in evangelism, the first step in a life-changing conversation with someone begins with you asking, how are you doing? And them saying, fine. And you saying, no. How are you really doing? I actually care. I actually care enough to listen. How are you actually doing? How is your family actually? Right? How is work actually? How are your relationships actually? How is your experience with being in high school for the first time and all the changes that are going on actually? How are you actually? And caring enough to listen to them when they speak with you. And what you're going to find, what you're going to find when someone realizes that you really care and that you're really listening, what they're going to start sharing with you is so much more than just an update on how things are going. What they're going to start sharing with you is how they're hurting, right? If you care someone how they're, if you, ask, if you care enough to ask someone how they're actually doing, does it matter where their house is located, what kind of zip code they're in, what kind of car they have, what kind of title they have on their business cards, how many kids they have, how good looking they are, what football team they're on, it doesn't matter what they have going on that you can see from the outside, every person is yearning for something more. Each and every person is looking for something out of life and from God. And when you start to listen to people, when you care enough to actually hear what's really going on in their life, they will start to share with you what they're really looking for. Something like what their place is really in this world. Something like the strength to go through another day. Something like a role model who won't let them down. Right? Something like a, 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 a belief or a recognition that the world must be different and must change. Something like real forgiveness that they can't give themselves. Right? Each and every person is looking for something. And when you care enough to listen, you're going to start to hear it. And last week, we left with a big cliffhanger, right? So you listen, right? You start to actually hear what's really going on in their life, and then you say what? Right? Then you say what? What you say to someone at that moment when the time is actually here, when two ordinary people are really sharing their ordinary lives, what you share is your story, right? What you share with this person after hearing what they really need is your story, and your story has two components to it, right? When you share your story, you share two things with that person, what you've found and where you found it. When you're sharing your story, when you're at this moment of evangelism, you share what you found and where you found it. And if that doesn't seem like it's enough to you, if that seems a little bit too simple, right, if you're expecting something grander, if you're expecting something greater, if you're expecting some sort of formula in order to say exactly the right thing to every right person, no matter the circumstances, I got to tell you, you are overthinking it, right? One of the first key things you need to know about the growth of faith in your life and in everybody else's life is a concept that we get from the Apostle Paul. In 1 Corinthians 3, verse 6, he says, I planted the seeds, right? Apollos watered, another teacher watered those seeds, but it's God that made them grow. I planted, Apollos watered, but God made them grow. One of the things that you need to realize is that your job is to plant and water seeds of faith in the life of other people, right? Do not burden yourself with trying to figure out what's the one perfect thing that I can say at exactly this moment. The growth comes from God in your life and in theirs, right? Your job is just to plant and water the seeds, and if you think the story of what you found and where you found it isn't enough, I've got two examples for you. One's from the Bible, one's from my life. 
about five years ago. This remarkable thing started to happen in my life and the life of 30-year-old men around the world. So uh, there's a frequent thing that happens, right? When I, uh, when I gather together with other groups of guys my age, same thing happened on Friday night, right? Uh, we, we had four couples got together. Uh, our wives all ended up speaking together inside. And within five minutes of arriving, all of a sudden, I found myself around the grill outside, three of us watching one guy burn burgers, <laughs> right? And about five years ago, something started to happen in these groups of guys. All of a sudden, every time I got together with these guys, the conversation would turn to Yeti. Now, for those of you who don't know, Yeti is a company that makes coolers. Specifically, they are a company that makes 200-pound, $500 coolers. And if you're anything like me, up until this point, thinking about coolers is something that tends to occupy about 0.0% of your day in thought, right? But these coolers apparently are absolutely extraordinary, right, in their ability to preserve heat or cold or whatever you need, right? But I've never seen an ad for Yeti. I've never seen a television commercial for Yeti. I've never seen a radio commercial for Yeti. But what I started to experience about five years ago is every time I would gather in one of these circles, other guys just like me, dads, all in our early 30s, would be sitting around in a group, and unfailingly, one guy would lean in and go, have y'all heard the good news about Yeti? <laughs> and they would start to share the story of their cooler, right? <laughs> but they would do it in the most textbook evangelism way I've ever experienced. They'd say like, before I had Yeti in my life, <laughs> my ice was melting, my drinks were hot. <laughs> but then I met Yeti and I let Yeti into my truck, and everything has changed, right? And they would even have these miracle stories, right? Every guy had experienced a Yeti miracle. He would be like, I was on a 72-hour road trip to Orlando. I had all of our lunch meat for seven kids for two weeks in the back of the truck. We get there, I pop it open, not one cube is melted, and another guy in the group would go, praise Yeti, right? <laughs> People would be sharing the story of what they found, right? And the guy would be like, where can I find this Yeti? And he'd be like, follow me. <laughs> <laughs> and I gotta be honest, in all this time, I never bought a Yeti cooler. I still don't have one, right? I still don't have one. It's not because it's not great, but I've never been in a situation where I had 75 pounds of deer meat and one bag of ice and I needed it to last like two weeks, right? That's just not a need I have in my life, right? Doesn't matter how amazing this cooler is, I gotta be honest, it's just not for me, right? Until one day, I was at one of these gatherings and a guy leaned in and he said, do you realize that Jesus is not just for the Jews but for the Greeks also? No, no, that's not what he said. <laughs> what he said was, do you realize Yeti is not just for coolers, but they're also making travel coffee mugs now? Because I don't have a need for a cooler. But in my soul, <laughs> I have a deep need for coffee that will stay hot for like six hours. <laughs> And I'm here to tell you, I now have a personal relationship with Yeti. <laughs> and I have seen the light. Right? That's a ridiculous example. Of course it is. Right? But I've never seen people, particularly in the guy community, right, just so enthusiastic about sharing and doing evangelism so perfectly, right? And my life used to be like this, and now it is like this. This is what I've seen. This is what I know is possible. Come and see, taste, and know that Yeti is good, right? 
like this is the example that perfectly mirrors what it is we are to do in faith, and we see an example of that in our biblical selection today, right? Leading up to this text, leading up to the scripture that we read today was a conversation between Jesus and a woman, and she's a Samaritan woman, which means she's from a community in an area called Samaria, and one of the things that you know if you dive a little bit more deeply into the text is that the idea that Jesus is speaking to this woman at all is shocking to the first audiences that hear it, right? Because people like Jews, like Jesus, would not interact with Sumerian people, right? They viewed them as dirty or different or other than, and to just have a conversation with them was to make yourself unclean, let alone for a pious religious teacher like Jesus to be speaking to a single woman of any kind, let alone a single Samaritan woman, or as we are later to discover in their conversation, a single Samaritan woman with a sketchy past, the very idea that he was talking to her completely shatters the understanding of who God is and what God is doing in this man. And all of a sudden, this woman who was ostracized from her community, right, seeking water far away from the rest of town because they had rejected her and they would not accept her found in this unlikely man, someone who knew everything about her all of the things that other people judged her for or called her not good enough for or left her behind for, he looked her square in the eyes and said, come and find the living water, the source of the life that you're looking for in me. I see you, I know you, I accept you, I love you. He said that to this woman, this person, the easiest kind of person to overlook or to step on or to step over. He says that to her and she goes running back to town and what she tells to the rest of the community, right? What she tells to this other community of people, many of whom are just like her, who are experiencing things just like her, who have needs just like her. She says to this community, look what I have found. Look at the love I have found, the good news I have found, the salvation I have found, the person, the Christ that I have found. Look what I have found and where I found it. Come and see. And in the text that we read today, the people say, we believe in this man, but no longer just because of what you said. We believe in this man because you showed us what you found and where you found him and we have seen him for ourselves. And now we know that he is truly the savior of the world. He is truly God's good news. He is truly the answer to whatever it is that we were looking for. One of the reasons that we can get so anxious or tied up in evangelism or tied to so many things, right? One is the belief that we've got to do it all somehow. Remember, God does this, right? All we do is introduce people to what we found and where we found it, and people come to experience and then come to believe for themselves, right? And another reason that a lot of us reflexively are just really hesitant to share the idea of faith is that too often the model of evangelism is rooted in arguing with people, right? Or trying to convince other people, right? Or having debates with other people that you are somehow charged to defend something that you might not feel prepared to do, right? Too often that is the model of what we think evangelism should be, right? But let me ask you, do you like it when anyone ever walks up into your life and tells you what you're doing wrong? Do you like it when anyone ever walks into your life and tells you where you're missing the mark, what you need to do to get it right? Do you like it when anyone else walks into your life and tells you what you really need? Oh, so don't ever treat anyone else that way. One of the things that we always hit as a stumbling block is whenever people say that, or act in a way that seems like they think they know us better than we know ourselves. For example, Uh, I was in a uh, training class once. It was kind of a management training class. It was giving you skills and and abilities to better lead in organizations, whether that's the business place or whether that's school or a family or anything, right? And I'll never forget one piece of advice that I got. And this is a piece of advice uh, that can help benefit you no matter what situation you're in, where you're speaking into other people's lives, professionally, as a family, whatever. They found that often 
We give positive feedback in extremely ineffective ways, right? If our desire is to help someone feel more confident or feel more able based on what we say, we often give that positive feedback in a way that doesn't actually help them feel better or more confident. For example, one of the ways that we typically give positive feedback is to tell someone you're smart or tell someone you're a hard worker or to tell a kid you're a good kid, right? Or to tell someone you come up with great solutions all the time. Right? You would think that would help, right? And yet over and over again, when we study the people who receive that affirmation, it might help for a little bit, but over time, that positive benefit to them starts to fade away. And the reason is, is because you can tell someone you're really smart. But for a lot of people, what they'll be thinking is, you don't actually know me. Right? Or you'll tell someone you're a hard worker. Right? But what they'll think about is all the times where they feel like they didn't work hard enough. Right? Or you'll tell your kid, you're a really good kid. They may be thinking to themselves, yeah, you didn't see me, right? But there was a way to give positive feedback that absolutely changed the way that people felt about themselves, and that is to say this. I gotta tell you, I've been working with you on this project, I've been working alongside of you, and I experience you as being incredibly smart. I gotta tell you, I was working on this project, I was seeing what was going on, and I experienced you as coming up with some really creative solutions to some really hard problems. I gotta tell you, I've been watching you your whole life, and over and over and over again, I experience you as such a kind and generous child. I gotta tell you, over and over and over again, I experience you as such a loving and supportive spouse, even in the hardest and darkest of times. And when we give positive feedback that way, what researchers find is it actually boosts the way that people thinking, uh, think about themselves. Does that make sense? And you know why? Because when you say to someone else, you're smart, you're kind, you're generous, you're good, they can say, you're wrong, you're wrong. But when someone says, I experience you as being very, very kind, you can't say you're wrong to that, right? That's what they experienced, right? When someone says to you, I, when, when you say to someone, I experience you as being so insightful or so brave or so good, they can't say you're wrong because that's your experience. You are the world's leading expert in your experience and no one can tell you that you're wrong. It's your experience. Of course, you know. And so when we get to that conversation about faith, when we get to that conversation about church, when we get to that conversation about Christ, don't tell people what you think they need right? Don't argue with someone about why their worldview is wrong. Tell them what you've found. Tell them what you've experienced. Tell them what you've come to know. And they will never argue that you are wrong because it's your story. You are the leading expert on your story. So when you say, I have found this, and here's where you can find it too, there's nothing they can say about you being wrong. It's true in your life, and you're offering it to them as well. That's all evangelism is. That's all evangelism for ordinary people is, caring enough to listen. And then when you come to know the hurts, and when you come to know the pains, and when you come to know the yearnings, and when you come to know the needs of other people, share what it is that you have found. Share what it is that you have come to know. Share what it is that you have experienced and invite them to come and experience it too. So now I ask you a question. Now I ask you the simple question, the only question, what have you experienced? What have you come to know about God and about Christ and about his love for you? What have you found? Have you found in Christ the answer to why you are here and what this world is all about? Have you found in Christ a model for what the world is meant to be and how he is changing it? Have you found in Christ the one person who will never let you down or never fail to show up when you need him the most? Have you found in Christ the forgiveness that you cannot seem to provide yourself? Have you found in Christ the strength for a another day. What have you found? Because around you, 
in your community, around you in your neighborhood, around you in your workplace, around you in the school that you attend or your children go to, people are in desperate need for just that. They are yearning for it. What have you found? And who can you show where to find it? Please pray with me. Great and loving God, evangelism is not hard, it is not scary, it is not uncomfortable, it is not us putting upon other people, it is not asserting dominance over other people. Evangelism is simply caring enough to listen, caring enough to come to know, caring enough to be there for other people in the midst of their hurts or yearnings or what it is that they need, and then God simply sharing what we have found, what we have come to know, what we have experienced in your overly abundant love and grace made real to us through Christ Jesus. Guide us and keep us, O oh God. Make us into your people. And it's in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit that we pray. Amen. Loving and gracious God, we come here today for many reasons. It begins with our desire to say thank you. Thank you for your gracious love. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for believing in us even when we don't believe in ourselves. Thank you in providing a story for us. And with that story, we have such a valuable treasure. With that story, we have found what we can share with others out of our interest, out of our love, and out of our recognition that you bless all of us to be blessings for others. And so with confidence, with smiles, and with great expectations, may we share that story today and in oh so many days to come. And may we always do so in Jesus' name who teaches all of us to pray together as we now say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. As our ushers come forward for, for our tithes and offering, we pray God's blessing on our offering with all your gifts that make things possible.
As we come to the close of our worship service, I want you to know that the doors of uh, Christ fellowship is always open. Tell your stories to your neighbor. Hear the stories of Christ and the good news, and we invite you forward to our closing hymn if you would like to be part of this church family. Well, for those of you who are good at picking up nonverbal clues, we're going to end with welcoming people into the congregation today. And there's no better way to end a service of worship than with welcoming into our Christian fellowship fellow members of the body of Christ. So uh, we have Abigail Cortinez, who's going to be joining. And then joining via baptism are going to be her children as well, Abigail Micah. So first, uh, I'm sorry, Tia, John Tia Johnson, I'm sorry. Uh, and you're Abigail Cortinez. So Tia, I want to ask you first, do you reaffirm your faith in Christ? Yeah. And you, you promise to be a loyal member of this church and uphold it with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness. Yes. Okay, then now additionally, as a parent, do you promise to teach and model the faith uh, for these two children so that one day they can come to accept Christ for themselves in front of this or some other altar? Yes. Abigail, Micah, would you please kneel on the rail right there? Abigail, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and pray God's richest blessings upon you. Amen. And would you place your hands on her as well? Abigail, Micah, the Holy Spirit work within you, that by water and the Spirit you may grow to be a faithful member and follower of your Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. So, Robert, you coming forward? Too scary? We'll talk about it. <laughs> Never force them. <laughs>
right? Uh, really quickly, as we come to the end, I'm going to ask Tia to stand forward and allow you to come forward and, and welcome her into this congregation. Uh, I also want to commend again to you the uh, Healthy Plate Discipleship class. It's going to be taking place next week. If you're one of the people who hears this message today and goes, I don't really know if I've experienced something that powerful yet, or I've experienced the shade of it and I want to come to know more, or I'm interested in becoming a part of this church, nothing could better prepare you than learning how to grow and come closer to God as a disciple than attending that class. It's going to be next Sunday during the 930 hour in room 350. We would love to help you take the next steps on your journey of knowing and loving Christ. Our gathering will soon be ended. Where will we go and what will we do? May grace, peace, hope, love, and joy forever accompany you. Amen.